Welcome to Partnering with Nature, a Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Rebecca Fornaby, a research associate with the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia. Through this series, we will hear from practitioners and researchers who are designing resilient and adaptive urban nature, engaging the public to protect and enhance their blue and green infrastructure, and addressing environmental justice issues through research and on-the-ground projects. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. In the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched with partner cities spanning the globe from Phoenix, Arizona, to Singapore, to Wellington, New Zealand. The webinar series is one of many ways in which the new Global Biophilic Cities Network will help to disseminate knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and individuals around the world. To learn more about the project, visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and at biophiliccities.org. Today we'll be hearing from Lila Higgins, Manager of Citizen Science at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Lila is a museum educator, naturalist, and LA River advocate. In 2008, she joined the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County working in the Education and Exhibits Department and overseeing the museum's citizen science efforts. She was a lead educator on the museum's Nature Lab and Nature Gardens exhibits which opened in 2013 and focused on the surprising biodiversity of Los Angeles. In her free time, Lila balloon maps up the LA River, holds river picnics and tours, and leads memory mapping workshops. She is a team member of Project 51, Play the LA River, and volunteers for Los Angeles Walks. Lila holds a bachelor's degree in entomology from the University of California, Riverside, and a master's degree in environmental education from the California State University in San Bernardino. Lila is going to speak for about 30 minutes and then answer a few questions about her work. So welcome, Lila. Hi, it's actually Lila. <laughs> Sorry about that. Welcome, Lila. <laughs> it's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> um, so hi, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So I work here at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And as Rebecca said, I am a huge LA River advocate, so the picture of the LA River on my opening slide. Um, and then if you want to follow along um, on social media, there's the, my, Twitter, my Twitter handle and also um, the work Twitter handle that we use here at the museum in our citizen science office. And if you don't know what citizen science is, don't worry, we are going to get to a definition really soon. Um, I just kind of want to give you some context about nature in Los Angeles. So here's the Natural History Museum. Um, I've been working here since 2008. And right as I got here, the museum started to go through this large transformation where we were um, spending a lot of money to redo and seismically retrofit um, our old building. It was built in 1913, which is really old to LA. I know it's not very old to other places in the world, but it's very old to Los Angeles. Um, and as we were doing that seismic retrofit, we also decided to do a lot of um, overhauls of some of our very old galleries. So as you can see, we've got a dinosaur hall exhibit, which is brand new. We did a new entrance to the museum. And we still have our iconic old amazing spaces like our diorama halls, because our visitors didn't want too much to be changed. And then in the top left corner, you can see that is part of the Nature Gardens, which is one of the projects that I was fortunate enough to work on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about more right now. So this is the old footprint of uh, the museum. And as you can see, there is a lot of um, parking spaces. There is a lot of uh, lawn areas. And there is um, some plantings that were very kind of biologically inert. So this is what was um, around the, the north and east side of the building, three and a half acres of space. As we were going through this large um, you know, program to really work on the museum and create all these new exhibits indoors, we decided that we wanted to make sure that that uh, transformation was visible from the outside. And we got some money from our county, um, our county museum, and uh, we got some money to be able to redo our, our car park. And we had to preserve the same exact number of car parking spaces, but that helped us to then decide that we were going to be able to move it all into one area and have a, a lower level to that car park as well as the upper level. And then that would free up a lot of space to have gardens around the museum, outdoor space that we could 
program in any way that we wanted that was really appropriate for us at the Dutch Christian Museum. And so this is what uh, you know our landscape designers uh, worked on. As you can see, we wanted to make, um, even though we knew we had to keep the parking lot on the site, we wanted to make it a car park instead of a parking lot, um, which is, you know, from my British background, uh, we call car park. Um, and so we had a large well in the center that has large lots of trees, there's lots of vines along the edge of the car park, and it really is filled with a lot of wildlife now. We've got hummingbirds that nest in the car park. We've got caterpillars and butterfly cocoons that uh, live on the vines and all sorts of wildlife and creatures and even some mushrooms live in that dark, uh, damp well in the under level of the car park. So that's what the rendering looked like. What does it look like in real life? Here's a couple pictures. Um, we put in a pond. We put in camera traps. You can see the squirrel here on the camera trap and an edible garden because a lot of kids here in Los Angeles don't understand where their um, fruits and vegetables come from. We want to be able to give them that experience of coming to the museum, picking a carrot out of the ground, washing it off, and being able to eat it and realize that carrots do actually grow on the ground. So this is kind of the, some of the context of uh, where we've been coming from. And again, we're a natural history museum. We wanted to have nature actually in context. You come into the museum and you see all of these dioramas, but you can now go outside and see the nature of Los Angeles humming and buzzing and chirping all around you. What I usually do this presentation this is one of the first slides that I show, and I have people say, you know, call out what are the things that, that this picture um, makes you think of. This is Los Angeles. You can see downtown in the upper center, and a lot of people say, Concrete, smog, traffic, industry, um, and a lot of the urban, you know, words that are associated with that. Many people don't necessarily look to the background and uh, see the mountain ranges that we have here, or the LA River that bisects through this picture and curves around, um, or indeed the trees and the plants and the animals that, if you were able to get down into the backyards, are living there. So there's this perception that there's no nature here in Los Angeles, but that indeed is not true. Um, we are actually in a biodiversity hotspot here in L.A. Uh, one of 35, this is an image by Conservation International, um, and they've designated 35 biodiversity hotspots around the world, and there's only one that really fits mostly in North, in North America. Um, a little bit of the Madrian pine oak woodlands does come up. Um, but the California Floristic Province is mostly in um, North America. And as you can see here, with a close-up, it's mostly in California. And it actually takes up a huge amount of our state. And as you can see, there's a number of metropolitan areas that the California Floristic Province is in, including you know, two of the largest, San Francisco and Los Angeles. But what makes a biodiversity hotspot a biodiversity hotspot? Well, you have to have at least 1,500 endemic vascular plants, so that means uh, plants that live here and nowhere else, and vascular meaning um, the higher plants, so not the mosses or the bryophytes. Um, and so we have this huge, amazing diversity of plants that live here, but it's also under a large amount of threat. To be a biodiversity hotspot, you have to have lost about 75% of that habitat. Um, and so we are under threat. Um, and as you can see, going back to the last slide, um, we're on par with places like the um, island of Madagascar, the tropical Andes, and you know the entire island of New Zealand. So these are the places that you would go on. They may be some of those amazing ecotourism trips that, that uh, people go on. And the California Floristic Province is one of those places. And a lot of people, especially people who live here, don't realize um, how important the nature is that is here. Um, but I want to kind of explain this with a story. So this is Dr. Brian Brown. He's our uh, entomologist here at the museum. He's one of the world's leading fly experts. And he decided to have a bet with a um, one of our trustees. Uh, Brian likes betting. And so they were at an event at a dinner. And Brian said, oh, I could easily find a new species of fly here in LA, just as easily as I could in 
supposed to read the local bill, which is where I do my field work. And the trustee says, okay, you're on. Why don't you set up a trap in my backyard? So this is the trap. It's called sort of a malaise trap, uh, like a little tent. And it's in the um, Brentwood backyard of the trustee. And so Brian left the tent up for an entire week. And there's a little tiny jar, which if you look really closely, you can see at the peak of the tent. And the insects fly in, hit the netting, get funneled up to the top, and then into the jar, um, and then die. It's the science, though. Um, and then they are brought back to the museum and are able to be looked at under a microscope. So Brian took the whole jar back um, after only one week of sampling and started to look through the flies. So here are three flies that he um, found to be interesting. The first very large fly you see in this um, picture was the very first fly that he pulled out of the sample. He thought it looked interesting, put it under the microscope, took it through his key, and realized it was a brand new species of science, never before been discovered. No scientist there found it. So that was pretty cool, just, just from looking at one fly. Um, he goes through the sample some more, um, finds another fly that looks interesting, the other one with the head popped off, uh, looks at that one under a microscope, and um, takes it through the key and realizes this is not a brand new species of science, but it's a, it's a fly that's never before been found here in North America. It had only been found in uh, Europe before. And then the third fly, the one on the bottom uh, right, also never before been found in North America, only had been found from both coasts of Africa um, and first time been found in North America as well. So from just one week worth of sampling, looking at only three small flies, uh, Brian made three discoveries to science that were new and um, expanded the ranges of, of the two of these flies to North America, at least in one Brentford backyard. Um, as, a, as well as the other places that they're already known to live. So there is interesting um, science to be done here, and it's a great amount of uh, knowledge that can be gained about uh, what's going on here in Los Angeles, then also that's translatable to what's going on in other cities with the urban nature as well. So how do you translate looking in one backyard at all of these flies to across an entire city, and maybe not just flies, but looking at other things, including reptiles and amphibians, or snails and slugs. Really, the only way to do that is citizen science. And this is uh, Dr. Greg Curley, our herpetologist. Um, and you know, we agree that it's literally the only way we can do that is citizen science, because we have to be able to get into all of these spaces. And a lot of those spaces are private. And so how are you going to get into those places? Our scientists can't go out into people's backyards. That would be a bad idea. Um, and uh, so we really have to start engaging our local community to, to help us with that. And as I promised, here is our definition of citizen science. We use the definition that Cornell Lab Ornithology uses. So basically, it's answering real world questions about what's going on um, in the world. And for us here at the museum, those questions are about what's going on with the nature of Los Angeles and it's uh, the general public working with our scientists. And here's one of those real people um, who worked with our scientists and made a really big discovery. So this is Brees. Um, at the time, he was, uh, I think, 11 years old. And Brees really loved lizards. And he found out about a project that we have at the museum called, at the time, Lost Lizards of Los Angeles, or LOLA, as we like to call it. We really love our acronyms around here. And he made a big discovery. He found this a lizard, just like this one, photographed on the wall um, while he was at a barbecue with his dad and his friend. And he was like, oh, this, I actually think that this is uh, uh, a lizard called a gecko, but I'm kind of confused because the geckos uh, that live in Southern California usually aren't around here. And he knew about the lizards that lived in his backyard, and he had like a lizard book, and he had gone through it. And so him and his father were like, wow, this is kind of interesting. So they submitted the picture uh, to the Natural History Museum, 
and we were able to work with the local scientists to figure out that this indeed was not a uh, Western um, um, striped a gecko that lives here. So this is the Mediterranean house gecko, the introduced species that's uh, well found. And it was the first one that had been found in LA County. So it was a pretty significant find. And he worked with um, our herpetologist, Dr. Greg Foley, who you saw earlier, to write that up and um, get that published in a scientific journal. Um, with his father. So they are listed as co authors, and this is um, released a couple of years later um, with the issue of Herpetological Review that he was written up in. So he actually became a published author at the ripe old age of 13 and helps us to understand better what's going on in the world um, here in Los Angeles, at least, with the introduced gecko species that are coming in. And so this is part of, of our project, which we now call Rascals, Reptiles and Amphibians of Southern California. Um, you can see here people are taking pictures with their smartphones of this amazing snake that we found on one of our field trips that we led. And this is a project with online naturalists. And as you can see, we've got over almost 15,000 observations to date. Um, and if you're not familiar with iNaturalist, I'm going to go a little bit into the details of, of how this project and how the projects of iNaturalist work off of the museum. Um, but before that, I want to tell you a little bit about our um, project that Brian started when he um, made that bet about whether he would be able to find a brand new species of fly. So he found, he, he, you know, he obviously won the bet, um, but he decided to expand on that. And we put up 30 traps um, as part of the Bioscan project that we bio biodiversity, um, science, city, and nature, Bioscan. Um, so we put 30 traps in families' backyards all over Los Angeles. Each one of these red dots represents one trap. And monitored those traps on a, um, the family would take out the bottle and replace it every week. So we would see what the insects were coming in on a weekly basis. And we had our scientists go out to put up traps. And we had weather uh, stations um, in the people's backyards as well. And then as the um, insect uh, vials, all those insects were coming back to the museum, they would come back looking full, just like this. And then we would have our work-study students and volunteers sort through those specimens and um, pin out the large uh, specimens and also put some uh, in, in alcohol in our collection. So we really rounded out our collection. And through that uh, three years almost of sampling, we found at least 30 flies. Now the number is up to 42. But each one of the families that had a trap in their backyard got a fly um, named after them. So they were able to work with our scientists to uh, get a fly named after them um, to honor their work as citizen scientists here in Los Angeles. So here's a list of our other citizen science projects that we have. As I mentioned, we've got Bioscan and Rascals. We also have a slime, which is uh, snails and slugs living in metropolitan environments. And uh, Southern California Squirrel Survey. We have a spider survey that's been going on since 2002. And then our kind of catch-all is uh, L the LA Nature Map on iNaturalist. And now I'll go into what iNaturalist is. So basically, it's really easy to participate. All you need to do is find wildlife, take a picture of that wildlife, and send it to us. Uh, you can use an account if you have an account on iNaturalist. But we really want to meet people where they're at. Um, and we know that not everyone wants to make an account on iNaturalist, and not everyone wants to um, uh, go through that step. Um, so we know that people can also send us uh, observations by email to the museum or through social media by hashtagging nature in LA. Again, iNaturalist is basically like Facebook for nature nerds. So you record your observations. You can use the free app on your smartphone. Um, you upload the observation. You get to be connected to these other naturalists here in, in your local area, but also all over the world. And then you can have people help you identify what you're finding. And so all of our scientists that run projects here at the museum are online naturalists. 
they respond to people when they find interesting things, or just to help identify that lizard that's in your, that you found in your basement or in your garage that you don't know what it is, but it's very common and that's a really good data point for, for us. It does work on all devices, so you can use it on a tablet or your smartphone or on your laptop uh, or um, your desktop computer. Um, it is on um, Apple and Android as well. And you can share your wildlife photos in this way. And you know, here's here's just a screen grab of some of the observations that have been sent into our uh, LA Nature Map. We are also making sure that people um, follow us on social media. We have Instagram account, Twitter account, and Facebook, and um, that's how we share a lot of our findings. And also encourage people to participate in many of the events that we have that go on throughout the year. Right now we have almost uh, 62,000 observations on our LA Nature Map. As I said before, this is a space where we, it's kind of like a training ground. Um, we don't have a particular scientist who's looking at every single observation on here, but we know that some people aren't going to necessarily see a reptile or amphibian or squirrel or a snail or slug in their backyard, but they're definitely going to see a plant. They may see a butterfly, they may see something else. And so we want to be able to get people in through the iNaturalist um, uh, uh, you know, a platform and make sure that they understand how to use it. And um, then they can start submitting to the actual projects that our scientists are working on and need that data for. I want to tell you a little bit about one of the um, events that we did earlier this year that was a really big success to help um, people in LA um, become citizen scientists and also to help them see nature that's all around us in the city, um, uh, not just here but also in San Francisco. So it was a, a challenge between uh, LA and San Francisco and it was the Natural History Museum down here and then my friends and colleagues who work at Cal Academy up in San Francisco. And it ran between April 14th and, and the 21st. And that included and coincided with the first National Citizen Science Day, which was on April 16th. We had a really great time. We were able to get uh, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti involved. Um, he made a video for us. He actually uploaded iNaturalist onto his phone and made an observation of a snail right outside of City Hall. This is um, the video of him right outside of City Hall as he was uh, right before he, he you know, snapped that picture and made an observation of the snail. And um, we had uh, tens of thousands of views of this video, and it really helped us to kind of get the word out and to get more people participating. Uh, we had the people participating of all walks of life, uh, lots of my friends, my mother, um, but also you know famous people like Moby. Sorry, mom, you are not famous. Uh, <laughs> but Moby did participate, um, which is really great because I think that added a little bit more excitement for everyone else. Um, and, and there was an article in the LA Times um, kind of highlighting this uh, rivalry between Los Angeles and San Francisco. That's a, that's a big deal here on the West Coast. You know, which city is better? Um, and, and again, that rivalry was something that we were able to play off of. Um, and so when myself and Allison, who works at Cal Academy, were interviewed by the LA Times, um, the LA Times uh, writer asked us, uh, who's, you know, what do you get if, if you're a winner of the challenge? And Allison basically said, well, bragging rights. And San Francisco really um, was set to win. They, they make more observations in that kind of same kind of time period. We thought they were going to win. And it turns out that uh, our citizen scientists came from, from behind, and, um, and, and we ended up beating San Francisco. Um, as the uh, challenge was being called at the end of the day, um, right before we like announced the winners on Earth Day, um, we had over 10,353 observations in LA, and San Francisco had 9,389. Ended up being a little closer uh, uh, after all things were said and done, but uh, Los Angeles was still ahead by a couple hundred, and. Uh, you know, we had 444 um, citizen scientists engaged in San Francisco, 574 in Los Angeles. Each uh, city made about 10,000 observations. 
There are about 1,600 species recorded in both places. Um, and, you know, we had some really amazing top contributors in both places. Um, the top contributor here in Los Angeles was James Bailey, who is a recent high school graduate. Um, he made 783 observations in that one week period, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then, you know, we have uh, Cedric Lee, who is also another one of our citizen scientists who uh, does amazing work here. Uh, UCLA student, uh, really in the snails and slugs and the flying project. He made 720 observations. Um, and as you can see, here is our kind of final page on our naturalist. Um, just really surprising how um, high the turnout was. Uh, in a regular week, on naturalist around the same time, we would usually get about 2,000 observations. So we really uh, made a huge spike in, and difference in the participation on that week. So that, again, 2,000 to 10,000 observations is, is a pretty wild jump. Case San Francisco's page. Um, so they, they were right, right behind us. And they were ahead for most of the week. But at the, at the very end, we made a really big push. And um, our citizen scientists in LA really came through. But again, what's the purpose of this whole thing? Why are we doing it? Um, so gathering all this data really helps us to better understand the city. And on a daily basis, we're making conservation decisions, urban planning decisions. If those conservation urban planning decisions are, are based on data that is um, uh, not complete or not holistic, then we're going to not be making holistic decisions. Uh, you know, we don't really know much about the insects of Los Angeles or in most cities. So um, we're actually starting to look at that. And through this data, we'll be able to um, make better and more informed decisions about urban planning and conservation in LA that will hopefully ultimately help us to build a city that works better for humans and for wildlife as well. And if we can do it here in Los Angeles, which is one of the um, I think we're 14th or 16th urban largest agglomeration uh, in the world right now. We can do it in all these other urban agglomerations, from London to Tokyo to Sydney to um, Johannesburg, really all over the world. And the City Nature Challenge um, was such a success this, this year, this coming year in 2017. Um, we're going to be doing the City Nature Challenge again. And we're going to be doing it in more than just LA and San Francisco. We're going to be expanding it to other um, cities in North America. And then in 2018, we're hoping to expand it to um, other cities around the world. We already have interest from other museums to be hubs for, for the challenge. Um, and so if you're interested in um, expanding out the City Nature Challenge next year, and you work at an institution that would like to help be a hub for the City Nature Challenge in your city, then um, contact myself, and um, we'll uh, you know get you get you on the hook and get you started. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, and I think it's time for questions now. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, we've got just a couple questions for you. Uh, first of all, it sounds like um, social media and smartphones are playing a huge role in citizen science. Um, so would you say that? Uh, citizen science efforts have grown in popularity and scale along with, um, you know, technology? I think that there's just so much more opportunity to get involved. Um, there's so, much, so many more people with a smartphone um, out there. Uh, you know, we have a lot of summer interns who work with us and work study students. And, you know, they, you know, maybe don't want to start a new, you know, um, having memberships on, on new platforms, but they already have an Instagram account or they have a Facebook account um, or Twitter. Well, it actually turns out that more kids have that Instagram account and they're like, sure, I have a Facebook, but I'm hardly ever on it. And Twitter, they're like, no, I'm not on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, again, trying to meet people where they're at, um, platforms that they're already using, um, and to engage them that way. And I think that there's, um, you know, there's still a long way to go. I don't think. Uh, we're working with uh, local communities in areas that are um, kind of data gaps, but also areas that are kind of underserved, where we have the museum hasn't really done that much work. And so we're just getting into those areas and seeing if uh, um, smartphones are something that uh, the local community in those areas uh, use and what 
platforms they might be using. So we're, we're just getting into that to see um, how we can meet uh, those different audiences where they're at. So I do think that uh, the technology um, and on, on the smartphones just really helps to open things up. Um, great. So on the flip side of that sort of, what would you say are some of the, you know, major challenges to running citizen science programs and what might be some ways um, that you've seen them overcome or that people might, um, that cities might overcome those obstacles? Um, it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, it's not just like send us your picture, thanks, we're, you're done now. Um, you want to have a, you know, kind of a conversation back and forth. Uh, you want to uh, feel like um, the people are part of a community if they want to be part of that community. And so, um, you know, we have three full-time staffers here at the museum who run um, and support our scientists and uh, um, basically field all the questions and, and have a, a lot of back and forth with our citizen scientists. Um, and run trainings. Um, iNaturalist isn't uh, the most intuitive uh, program to use. Um, so we, we try to do trainings on the regular um, for people to uh, help them. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work with our school and teacher uh, staff here at the museum to, to get teachers uh, more engaged and to do training. So I think it's, uh, you know, the idea that, uh, oh, citizen science is, uh, is going to, um, you know, help us and it's not going to take us that much effort and to be able to get all this data um, uh, with not much input. That's not necessarily the case. Um, of course, it's different for each project and program and uh, there's a lot that can be done and you can really try to select and plan and, and um, uh, create programs and projects that, that uh, are the most uh, smart and uh, are basically using the least amount of stuff, uh, energy, and time. Um, but again, I think it really you have to really plan for what uh, what your outcomes want, to, what you want your outcomes to be, um, and plan your projects accordingly. Um, okay, well that, that answers our questions, um, and that concludes this Biophilic Cities webinar. Um, so thank you so much, Leila. Okay, no and um, thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time.